So my name's Troy Hinke, and as she said, I'm the owner of Living Roots Compost Tea. Um, I'll get into my background in a second here. So I was brought here to give a day intensive on compost tea mainly, uh, but to get good compost tea, we need to have a little bit of a knowledge of the soil food web and compost. So this morning we're gonna be going over the soil food web basics and ways that I've come up with to make, not that I've come up with, but that I have used to uh, make good compost with good high quality biology for using in compost teas. So this morning we're gonna be covering compost and then uh, we'll have a presentation. We'll go outside and check out if you have, if you have heard of the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. We're gonna, they've got a few going here. We're gonna check out one of those. And then after lunch, we're gonna talk about compost teas with a presentation. And then we've got some brewing here and we'll go check out the brewer. Uh, and then grab some samples and we can put something up on the microscope or up with the microscope on the thing here. And then uh, we'll have a question and answer also in the afternoon. And we can have a question and answer over, uh, you know, this morning too with compost. It's gonna be packed with information. Uh, the name of this presentation that I come up with is setting up on-farm composting systems for quality compost on any scale. So my background, uh, I was the compost production specialist at the Rodale Institute in Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And I was super fortunate that I got to work with Elaine Ingham that was there as the chief research scientist. So I worked side by side with her doing compost and compost tea research on a large and small scale. So I went to Rodale from Tennessee and then went with the intention of going back to Tennessee and went back to Tennessee and started an organic farm for a year with my partner and we ran a 10 family CSA. So I've got a background in organic farming as well. And then I worked with an organic landscape company in Nashville as their soil specialist. So I uh, worked with landscapes also, landscapes and lawns. And then I worked at a large scale compost facility in the Nashville area that composts uh, plant matter, tobacco, food waste, wood chips. Um, so I've got the experience with a large scale compost facility and then I started my business in 2017 and I've been doing, working professionally with a soil food web or compost for uh, about nine years now. So what we're gonna talk about today or at least this morning is uh, soil food web basics. Has everybody here heard of the soil food web? I have this set up kind of from a beginner to medium skill level. So the things that I'm gonna be talking about, you guys are gonna be kind of like, okay, yeah, I already know this or at least some of it, but I just wanted to warn you that like this presentation is set up for people who may not know anything about composting. So we're gonna get into ingredients for composting, management of turned piles. So uh, I called it turned because they're gonna normally be aerated piles, but I also do static aerated piles. So uh, turned piles, small thermal, large thermal, windrows, aerated static piles, and then we'll go over vermicomposting on a few different scales, home vermicomposting, medium scale, and continuous flow through bins. And then we'll be talking about the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. I'm just gonna play the video from YouTube. If you guys haven't ever heard of that, I'm just gonna play the video from YouTube because it's best to just let them explain how they do that, and it's 10 minutes long, so I can kind of go over what, why they do what they do, and then we'll go out and check out the Johnson Sioux bioreactor outside here. Okay, so soil food web. Uh, I believe most of you here have probably heard of the soil food web at least or seen the little graphic on the soil food web. This is the very first part of the food chain before we ever get to us or other mammals. Um, it's called the soil food web and that the interactions between them aren't necessarily linear and some things are eaten by or eaten, eating other things. And the important thing about this is that we've got plants that are photosynthesizing and using energy from the sunlight to create carbon that they're pumping into the soil. And we've got microorganisms that are feeding off of the carbon that's being pumped into the soil through plants and also through residue from plants, dead plant residue from organic matter. And from this first level of bacteria and fungi who are decomposing things, that starts the chain or the soil food web. And predator-prey relationships. So the most nutrients in the soil in the world are held in microorganisms. And rather than 
thinking that we need to manage plants by putting chemicals down to give them nutrients. We just have to realize that the nutrients are either in the soil in microorganisms or in organic matter and take advantage of that by either adding organic matter through plants and plant residues uh, along with getting good biology in there. So we've got bacteria and fungi. We're going to be covering all this throughout the presentation here. But we've got bacteria and fungi who are breaking down plant matter. And then their predators who are coming along and eating them and releasing all those nutrients that they're holding in their bodies. And as they poop that out, it's going to be in a plant soluble form. So uh, plants kind of manage their own needs through that. So the first decomposers in the soil food web are bacteria and fungi. Bacteria do decompose things that are lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, so things that are 30 to 1 or less carbon to nitrogen ratio. Uh, so green things like blades of grass, weeds, things without a whole lot of lignin and cellulose. And then we've got fungi. And the type of fungi that decomposes things is called saprophytic fungi. So there's two types of fungi mainly in the soil. There's saprophytic fungi and there's mycorrhizal fungi. Saprophytic fungi breaks down dead plant matter. And many of you have probably heard of mycorrhizal fungi. Mycorrhizal fungi has a symbiotic relationship with plants. So saprophytic fungi eats away at woody cellulose, lignin, high, stuff high in lignin. Uh, they release enzymes and acids to break it down. Bacteria and fungi both don't really have mouths that they eat things with. They instead secrete things from their body that chews away that allows them to digest that material then. So mycorrhizal fungi, if you have heard of that, it, when we're talking about compost, you're not really going to have mycorrhizal fungi in compost. You may have mycorrhizal spores but you're not going to really have mycorrhizal fungi because it's an obligate symbiont, which means that it needs a host plant to have a symbiotic relationship with. In saying that, just on a side note, like if you ever see potting soil that has um, mycorrhizal spores in that, the mycorrhizal spores need to come in contact with a root in order to, to sporulate. And if you buy a cubic yard or whatever, a big bag of uh, potting soil that has mycorrhizal spores in there, you're kind of wasting your money because there's a lot of spores in there that aren't even going to come in contact with the root. So it's better to buy a powder. And that's just a side note and suggestion for all y'all that want to use mycorrhizal spores in the future. This is not the best picture, but it's a close up of uh, saprophytic fungi on some wood chips. So this is one of the large windrows of the compost facility that I worked with. And I found a little chunk of uh, you can see wood chip here, wood chip, wood chip. So this is a bunch of wood chips with other broken down matter in there. And the wood chips are covered in white fungal hyphae that is saprophytic fungi. If anybody's interested in getting mycorrhizal spores, I've had a few questions. So because biology, soil biology has gotten so big, everybody's jumping on the bandwagon trying to make money off of it. So it's good to go with a really reputable company. Mycorrhizal applications uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, so they know what they're doing and should have a good product. That's why I always go with. And you can get liquid and powder forms. And then um, Bigfoot Mycorrhizae. So the guy that started mycorrhizal applications sold it. But his son started a company that's called Bigfoot Mycorrhizae. And um, they add worm compost and biochar to their little mixes um, to help get the biology going better. And then Paul Stamets has, I think it's called Myco Grow. If you guys aren't familiar with Paul Stamets, uh, I would definitely check him out. Uh, he's a huge mycologist, um, big into mycology. He's not a huge guy. Uh, there's a new film out, newer film out called Fantastic Fungi that is amazing. And if you haven't seen it, you should really go and try and find a screening near you. It's, it's incredible. Uh, Paul Samus is in that movie. So yeah, he also has a product. Uh, he mainly does medicinal mushroom stuff, but they I don't know how long ago it was that they just started coming out with um, mycorrhizal stuff, too. So his should be good. And this, this is a product that you stir into your compost? Be, and no, 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 no. I was just mentioning I wouldn't have even brought it up because it's not normally in compost. But if you want to take advantage of 
mycorrhizal spores, you can buy it in a powder or liquid form. Yeah. And you're applied and then to you the would growing plant? And then you would apply it to your seeds or to your starts, or if you have a tree that's already going. So I, I'll do it, I'll put spores into my compost tea and do root injections and inject it into the rhizosphere so that it's getting, the spores are getting it close to the root zone there. And then once they're growing, they get it from? Then they colonize and they'll take off into hyphae and reach out into the soil. Yeah. Yep. So mycorrhizal fungi, I like to call them extendo arms. Um, your root, you know, your root ball is only going to be this big and you've got mycorrhizal fungi that attach to those roots and shoot out into the soil both horizontally and vertically. So in a drought year, when the water table lowers, you're going to have fungi that's reaching down and able to suck up water along with other nutrients and minerals and pull that and send it to the roots and feed the plant. Um, and then how plants talk, it's a PBS documentary that's like 45 minutes. You can find it on YouTube. And there's a lady, uh, Susan, I always forget her last name. She's from British Columbia, who's done a bunch of research on um, mycorrhizal fungi. And if I remember correctly, they inject a mother, some type of spruce tree, and then use like a, not a metal detector, but a reader that reads whatever they inject it with. And so like when they put it up to the mother tree, it's like beep, 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 beep. And they go out there. I'm not sure if it's one or two days later, but it's just within a few days. and they go around and test different areas around there and there's saplings close by that is, have been injected with or have been filled with what that mother tree has had been injected with it. So it's sending out whatever nutrients that the saplings need through their roots into the mycorrhizal fungi. So there's this whole network underground that they're talking and communicating and feeding each other. And I also learned that if that a mother tree can detect a disease in an area in a forest and will not allow a sapling to grow because they know it's not going to thrive in that condition so they won't allow and send nutrients to that area so that the sapling doesn't grow too. So it works kind of in the opposite way, which is pretty fascinating. Just to recap real quick, we've got bacteria and we've got fungi. Those things are breaking down carbon, nitrogen in plant residues. The main thing they feed off of is root exudate, so plants are photosynthesizing turning sunlight into mainly sugars that they're pumping out through their roots. And uh, bacteria and fungi are feeding on that. So plants, we'll, we'll get into that in a few more slides here, but plants put out foods for bacteria or fungi. Bacteria or fungi are taking up those nutrients, storing them in their bodies. And then at, when we're going to get into the next slide here is going to be their predators that are going to come along and eat them. So protozoa and nematodes are what are going to be coming along and eating bacteria and fungi. Protozoa are made up of testate amoeba and naked amoeba. I've got a picture coming up here of a testate amoeba. Uh, flagellates are, I always forget any better example than like uh, most people know what sperm looks like. It's got a little tail that swims around. That would be like what a flagellate is. It has flagella, which is their tail that propels them through the water. And then uh, ciliates are another type of protozoa. I'm not wanting to see ciliates. I am wanting to see amoeba and flagellates, but ciliates are a sign of low oxygen or anaerobic conditions. I'm looking for them, but I'm hoping to not see them. And then nematodes. Nematodes are identified by their mouth parts. Most people, if you've ever heard of nematodes, it's most likely in a negative way because of root knot nematodes. Root knot nematodes are a big problem and a pest, but the most nematodes in the world are beneficial nematodes. And I actually, I can't remember the exact fact, but I believe it was out of any animal in the world, there's more nematodes than anything else. But yeah, so mainly what I see is bacterial feeding nematodes. So obviously bacterial feeding nematodes are eating bacteria. Then there's fungal feeding nematodes that have a spite like a spear, it's called a stylet, and the spear stabs out through their mouth and stabs into fungi and then sucks the nutrients out. Um, and then you've got predatory nematodes, which normally go after root feeding nematodes, but will also get after other types of nematodes. But their first source of food, preferred food, is root feeding nematodes. 
You can purchase predatory nematodes if you were ever to have an issue with root knot nematodes. Um, I've never done this, so I don't know the, exactly how that works, but um, you can look up uh, biological, uh, like Google biological pest management or whatever and purchase them. And then uh, the root feeders, which are parasites and parasitize plants and cause issues with your crops. The root feeders also have a stylet. Um, but they have a little different structure in their kind of esophagus area that uh, shows that they're different from the predator, sorry, fungal feeding nematodes. So this is the head. This is just the front half of a nematode. Uh, let me use my pointer here. This is the mouth. This is the esophagus. Um, I've got a, I don't know if I can find it because I, I couldn't find it the last time I looked, but I've got a cool video where you can see the organs pumping and the bacteria gets sucked through the organs here, back through the back end. And like I said, they're identified by the mouth parts. Uh, this one doesn't have any crazy mouth parts or any stylets to show. This is a bacterial feeder right here. Most of the show, slides I'm going to show you are at 400 times magnification. And I'll try to point out what magnification I'm at when I'm looking at this for anybody who's more nerdy and cares. This one is at, should be 100 times magnification. And this shows the full nematode. This is the head and the mouth. And this is the tail. Uh, the tail is normally always kind of pointy. Sometimes they'll have even like a, a single hair that goes out. And they look like a snake. And they're normally really wriggling hard when I'm looking at a sample to the point where you have to kill them or slow them down to identify them. So I'll, when I'm looking with my microscope and when we, I can, we can go over microscope stuff later when we, this afternoon when we're talking about the microscope. But I'll see them and note them, and then I'll come back once I've noted everything else and then use a lighter underneath the slide to get them to either killed or slowed down so that I can then focus in on the mouth part right here and see what kind of nematode that it is. This right here that looks like an olive is a test date amoeba. So that this is a shell that they live in, which is the test. And sometimes there's kind of a, a line right here, which is like the blob that's like part of their body. And sometimes that will come out of the shell while they're eating. But normally, uh, be, I guess it's because of shaking them up in the sample, they'll be in their test, kind of like a turtle sucks its head back in its shell when it wants to protect itself. And then it's full of bacteria here that it's eaten. Farther on in the food chain is microarthropods. So like uh, springtails, if you've ever seen those little hoppers that are in uh, worm compost a lot, that's a type of arthropod. This is a microarthropod. They've got eight legs. Sometimes you'll just see like little leg pieces in the microscope sample where they've been shredded up. But they mainly are going through and chewing stuff up and shredding. Uh, material into smaller particles, and they'll also be chewing through fungi and helping to cycle nutrients that were held in the fungi to the plants. All right, so this is a picture. I actually borrowed this from Elaine because it makes a great representation of how plants and microorganisms work together. So for eons, before humans were ever around, plants and microorganisms have had symbiotic relationships. And as I was saying, plants photosynthesize sunlight turn it into carbon, sugars, proteins, carbohydrates, and pump those out through roots. And they're attracting bacteria or fungi. So if you've got the reason that there's cakes and cookies on here is because if you have uh, protein, carbohydrates, and sugars, and mix those together, you get cakes and cookies. So the best example to use is that the tree's making cakes and cookies and putting out what are called root exudates or foods through the roots to attract bacteria or fungi. So a plant knows what it needs, and it'll be like, OK, I need some more magnesium. I'm going to send out signals and foods that are going to attract things that are going to bring me magnesium, which are most likely probably going to be fungi, uh, or you know, whatever it needs, it's managing. And like I said, this has been around for eons since humans around were not even on the Earth. So the conventional thinking is that we see our plants have a deficiency, and we want to treat the symptom of the deficiency. And so we buy a chemical 
to put that and feed the plant. What we need to be doing is promoting soil biology so that the plant can manage itself and we're just helping to manage the soil biology to make sure that the plant has what it needs. To make sure that the soil has what it needs so that the plant can get it from the soil, I should say. Also, uh, a good note is that all these microorganisms are, that I'm going to be discussing are usually aerobic microorganisms or facultative anaerobic, uh, facultative aerobes, which means that they could go either way, but if, they're, if it's aerobic conditions, they're going to be aerobic. And also that they live on uh, little microfilms in the, of water in the, in the soil. So um, I always, and I'll probably do it again somewhere in my presentation today, but a great analogy for composting is to think about, uh, and microorganisms, is to think about food preservation. Uh, so one way that we preserve food is through salts, and we salt hams. And the whole reason that we want to preserve foods is because bacteria and fungi come along and eat the organic matter that is our food, and we're trying to preserve our food from having bacteria and fungi move in and eat that. So we use salts and like salted ham, and this is also why chemicals and things like that kill uh, chemical fertilizers, sterilize the soil, because when we're using chemical fertilizers, like I grew up in Iowa, there's just tons of soybean and cornfields that are just getting of application after application of uh, synthetic fertilizer, which is made up of salts. So you're just salting the earth over and over again. And it's minute, but it's going to build up, and it's going to eventually kill all the microorganisms to where you make your plants chemical dependent. And they need you to feed them chemicals, and the chemical guy's making money, and you're not. So. With food preservation, also we dehydrate food. And so in the opposite thinking, if we're trying to promote organisms, we want to make sure and keep all of our material moist. Or anytime we're trying to promote living soil or compost, we need to keep things moist and do things that are going to benefit that and keep things, keep the environment and habitat uh, to where microorganisms want to be and not go dormant. So moisture is always really essential.